Joining me now on the next film school podcast. He's a reporter so talented that I learned today. He has the capability of interviewing uh, the very best of the NBA, NBA stars, and not even needing an answer from them because he could just answer his own questions that he asks. And that is, of course, the one and only Fred Katz of The Athletic. <laughs> How have I never seen that clip before? I don't know. It went pretty viral when it happened. When I don't think it? the listeners are going to. That was 2016. That was like right after I joined the beat as a thunder beat writer. Okay. So it's a while. You want to give a little backstory of what, what we're talking about? Cause I feel yeah, like, well, the backstory was it was the thunder second round playoff series against the Spurs in 2016. And I was in a press conference and Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook were up at the podium together. And I wanted to ask Kevin Durant about, you know, a spectacular second half that Westbrook had. And instead of addressing him as Kevin, which is his name, I accidentally called him Fred and then stumbled over myself and said, I don't know why I'm asking myself a question. And then KD says into the mic a line that gets quoted back to me all the time by so many of my friends, which is good job, Fred, said very sarcastically and very well delivered by him. Russ, Russ and KD make a face looking at each other. They got memed about a million times. And then I say Russell Westbrook was a lot more impressive in the second half than I was asking that question. What's going through your mind when that happens? And uh, what happened was the game was on TNT because it was a playoff game against the Spurs second round series. And and uh, TN, TNT, like inside the NBA, cut into the press conference literally for that question. And that was the first thing that showed. And like, it's inside the NBA, you know, like it's not like people are looking to laugh. I picked up at the time, like heading into that press conference, I think I had like 3,500 Twitter followers and I had like 6,000 by the end of the night. <laughs> Good for you. See, you was, did, I bet you did it purposefully, you sly dog, to try to... Uh, exactly. I've been accused of that before. Yeah. Just intentionally failing to the top. I mean... If I've gotten to the top, if I'm getting to the top, it's going to be failing my way there. So, man, it's wild. You covered Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook when those two players were on the same basketball team. I don't, I don't think I appreciate that enough. I just want to throw that out there. If you had to write a bio of one of those two, in which you got to like all extensive, like it, it, all all like dive as deep as you could possibly want, someone would pay you money to do this. Which which of those two would you do a bio on? Russ without hesitation. Without hesitation. Yeah. I mean, well, on a personal level, like I covered Russ a lot longer than I covered Kevin. I, I came in near the end of Kevin's final year in OKC. So I don't really have the professional relationship with him that I've had with other guys who I covered for much, much longer. I covered Russ in OKC. I covered him again in Washington. And to this day, he is the most compelling person. I have ever covered. And really? certainly, oh, he is an unbelievably compelling person. There are no other people like that guy. And and I think everybody can see that. So like as a writer, you kind of fall in love with um, characters, you know, people who are actually interesting people, independent of whether they're people that you just want to, you know, there are some people who, if you said to me, hey, you want to go to dinner with that person for two hours? I would love it. They're just a lovely person to hang out with, just a wonderful guy, but they're not interesting to write a story about because they're just normal, lovely, wonderful people. And that's not very interesting to most people. But there are some people who I don't necessarily need to go to dinner with, but man, would I write the crap out of a feature about them. And uh, those are those are the compelling people. And it's not necessarily mutually exclusive. It's not either or. Russ is so compelling. He's so interesting. He has a fascinating brain, fascinating life, fascinating mind, fascinating interests. He's one. He is as competitive as a human being could possibly be. NBA players' minds are blown by how competitive he is. And NBA players are some of the most competitive people you're ever going to see. So yeah, Russ. And not that KD, by the way, is not interesting or wildly competitive. He obviously is. I just have more of a personal experience covering Russ and have been constantly fascinated by his personality for a long time. As in, 
I don't, am I an impartial observer? I don't know. Andrew would be a better person to, to ask. I think I'm impartial when it comes to those two because I don't really care for either. I would absolutely read a biography on Russ. I don't know that I'd be that that interested in one on Durant or as interested, I should say. I'd, I'd read both, but like. Yeah. Also, part of the reason is like, you know, part of why KD is not interesting from a journalist perspective. Well, I'm curious what you're going to say. Why? He's an open book. That's true. He's, yeah. the, he's like one of the most honest people in the league. You know, if you want to know what Kevin Durant is thinking, you know what you do? You just ask him, hey, what are you thinking? And he's just going to tell you, which is, by the way, a phenomenal personality trait, but it's not as great for like a compelling character standpoint. Part of the thing that's fun, actually, I, there are a lot of things about covering Russ that are that are not fun. And I don't think it's 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 uh, it should be that shocking for people to hear that, given you know, the stories of, of Russ with media and all that kind of stuff. And there are certainly a lot of things that are not fun and covering Kevin is cool for sure because his basketball mind is incredible. And I think you see the people who ask the right questions who just want to delve into the basketball. He's willing to like go nuts with you on basketball stuff and hearing him, he's got an unbelievable NBA mind clearly. And Hearing him talk about basketball and hearing him talk about things that he's passionate about is so cool and fascinating. And I would love to cover him now and kind of be able to do like nerdy basketball stories with him. I think that would be such a privilege. But with Russ, in terms of like a book, when you're talking about narrative, like it is really fun to be able to uncover a Russ anecdote because every Russ anecdote that you get, you're like, oh, wow, that's how the hell they do that. Like, what the hell? What the, like, you hear a Russ Anderson joke, you're like, holy crap. This dude made Cameron Payne come into the, come to the, he made Cameron Payne when Cameron Payne was a rookie. He made Cam go to a gas station before every single uh, flight and buy him Apple Snapple before the flight as part of his rookie duty. And he had to show up with Apple Snapple. And then at the end, it had to be Apple Snapple. And he had to get not the early apple juice Russ because right, not lemon apple snapple, snapple. Apple snapple. That's good. Yep. And he had to get him apple snapple. And then at the end of Cam's rookie year, Russ told him he doesn't even drink apple snapple. He just wanted to make sure that Cam was the first player at the team playing because he doesn't like being held up late by the rookies. <laughs> and it's stories like that where you're like, this man is one of one, you know, like he is wildly competitive and. He's just a maniac and hey, some people are going to get to see him at the garden on Tuesday night. Yeah. Um, good, good transition. Yeah. Russ, uh, the I don't know if we should call it the big three anymore. Big, although it feels disrespectful to Russ to not include him in that, uh, whatever they're the, they're the big something They're the Los Angeles Lakers. They need, they need no nicknames. Um, that'll be an interesting game, uh, for the Knicks, an interesting homestand coming up for the Knicks. Um, tough to transition from talking about Russ, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it this You've been before we get into some trade stuff and some quickly stuff later because you have a piece coming out out of manual quickly. Um, this season in general, because as you said, you've covered a lot of NBA seasons, some quite interesting ones, some quite good ones in terms of the results, um, and then maybe some not as interesting ones. Hi, Washington Wizards. Um, I feel like this season has been a pretty interesting one, right? From a, from a general perspective, like what are your, I, I always like want to start off with you with like a kind of a general big picture. Like what are your thoughts on like the state of the Knicks at the moment? Like how has this year been for you? You know, I actually thought they were going to be extremely uninteresting. And in terms of the results, they're not, they're <laughs> not much about different. Yeah. Like yeah. the results aren't much different than what I thought they would be. Like, I think they're a little better than I thought they'd be because because Brunson's been better than I thought he'd be. Randall's been better than I thought he would be. And and the team is a little bit above the pace that I thought. I think I picked them to win 39 games. And they're 27 and 24. And they've obviously played way better since the start of December. But the way that they've gotten there is a lot more interesting than I thought the way they would get there would be. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, I know what you mean. <laughs> gr- gr- <laughs> they're, 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 they're vacillations between between being the 96 bulls and the 2012 bobcats is extraordinary can i don't want to cut you off but i've I've made the argument that that's what mediocrity looks like in the nba but i feel like maybe that's an overstatement that there is something somewhat unique about this team no it kind of is 
it is what mediocrity looks like, but they're just doing it to an extreme. Like it's, <laughs> it's, good, yeah. it's extreme, you know, it's, extreme mediocrity. I, That's it. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, it's quite title. the oxymoron. It's quite the oxymoron. And you know what? It, it makes perfect sense. Uh, I think Randall's season has been super interesting. I think Jalen Brunson's season has been super interesting. And I think he's a really fun player to watch. Like, I think they're more fun to watch than, I thought they would be, I thought they'd be like a slog to watch, but Brunson is really fun to watch when he's playing well and he's usually playing well and Quickly's fun. Grimes is fun. Like Sims is fun. They've got some, some fun guys. And, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of interesting things about them. If you take away like the rooting interests, especially like for someone like me and obviously not for you or probably all the listeners of this podcast, but like, the Obi Toppin situation is interesting. Everything going on with Emmanuel quickly, the tropes of his season, interesting. Quentin Grimes' development, interesting. Like Julius Randle's comeback season, very interesting. Uh, I, I, I think there are a lot of, I think it's a really interesting team, but I don't know. I also have this habit where I become totally and completely obsessive with the beats that I'm on. I still... I was joking with Josh Robbins, our Wizards beat writer today, that I still just like have sleepless nights because I'm thinking of Otto Porter trade exceptions from when I was covering the Wizards. And so, so you know, I, I become too obsessed with this kind of stuff. So maybe, maybe I just have Nick Stockholm syndrome at this point and they're super boring. No, I, I think they're interesting. What do you, what's your answer? I want to know your answer. No, I think you phrased it perfectly. I think they are a mediocre team that has taken mediocrity. To, to an extreme degree. Um, you mentioned like different from a fan's perspective. There's been both good and bad because there has been some high highs, you know, um, I would say more recently, I, I think the last two wins they've had are their best two wins of the year. Before those, there was certainly more low lows um, of differing natures too, which, which is always interesting, you know, and then you'd look up and there'd be like however many games over, over 500. So there was this weird dissonance in that. Um, I am fascinated by where they are at right now for a couple of reasons. And this is, I want to get into I, John. Can I, can I interject with one thing first, please? All right. So number six through number 13, 12 in the East right now is separated by five games, right? In the West, you've got number three and number 13 separated by five games this is heading into Monday night's games. Mediocrity feels extreme because everybody's at the same level. So like these crazy comebacks and fall offs, like you give up 145 points to the thunder in the beginning of the year. You're like, Oh, bad loss. The thunder are just as good as 20 other teams in the league. You know, actually the thunder might be better. The thunder are good. Well, they certainly you have know? a player that's better than a lot of other teams have on their so on their team. Yeah, so it's so it's just like you know the the everyone has all of these losses. They're considering bad losses, but the league is so close that just like a loss to the twenty six and twenty six Utah Jazz is not a a a bad loss. Just like a loss to the twenty five and twenty four Golden State Warriors isn't a bad loss or an okay loss. It's just like all these teams are five hundred, and that's it. And and the Knicks are one of those teams within a few games of five hundred. It's just how the we have to adjust to what the league is this year. NBA fans are so used to there being the elite and the crap, and they're not being much of a middle class. And I feel like we kind of have to adjust our perspective to acting more like baseball fans, where it's like if the Yankees lose a game to, you know, the, the, I, I guess I can't use the Baltimore Orioles as the bad team anymore. If the Yankees lose a game to the Detroit Tigers, Yankees fans aren't freaking out. Oh no, the Yankees lost to the Tigers. What's next? You know, there's, it's not all the way that direction of where baseball is right now. It's just, it's just inching more in that direction than it's kind of ever been in a really long time in the NBA. And I'm just, I wanted to look it up to double check because it's not only the records, but I don't know if you want to have the cutoff point at the Bucks have a plus 2.2 net rating or the next team down, which is the Knicks at plus 1.6. 
But then you go through all these teams and you could get down all the way to 25. And that's the Pacers at negative 2.2. And even if you want to go, actually, probably the cutoff should be the team right before them, which is the Los Angeles Lakers at 24 at minus 0.8. So that means in terms of net rating differential, there's a difference of essentially like 2.4 2.4 points per 100 possessions separating 9 through 24. That's insane. That is insane. That's wild. What a great point. That's wild. It really, I mean, we don't see that's not, like you said, it's not normal. You don't usually have that many teams bunched up together, which is why, like, I guess there's an, well, I, with LeBron and AD healthy, I'm not sure it's a good argument, but I guess there's an argument a Knicks fan can make and be like, oh, no, we're home tomorrow. We're facing the Lakers. We should win that game. You know, they're in whatever place they are, where and whatever. But no, that's not a real argument. Um, <clears throat> which brings me to the trade deadline, which you wrote about. Uh, you had an article drop today um, in which you really, really expertly went through not only all the different teams that should be on the Knicks radar for a variety of reasons. And I would encourage everybody to go read that. Um, but you also wrote last week an article uh, basically with the many questions that are facing the Knicks ahead of this trade deadline. And in between those two articles that you wrote, someone of some modicum of importance to the New York Knicks went on and a radio, I guess, what was a radio show and a television program and uh, spoke a little bit. Went on Fox five and then went on WFAN. WFAN. There you go. And spoke a little bit about some things which we're not going to talk about because I just don't have it in me. Um, And he spoke a little bit about the basketball team. And he did say for the first time, because Leon Rose, you know, is not the most talkative type. He said a word that is might be taken as a goal or perhaps a mandate, depending on your point of view. And that's playoffs. He said the word playoffs. That is what he is expecting. And then I thought he followed it up with something even more interesting, which is that, when I don't know if it was uh, I don't know who pressed him on it, but like so, would a first round playoff exit be okay? And then he talked about the summer ahead, and he's like, as long as we're making steady progress to get better after this season. So I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm looking at this, and I'm like, you know, right now the Knicks are fine. They're not going to. I don't think you expect. I don't expect. I don't think most Knicks fans expect them to win a first round playoff series. Okay, so if you don't do that and then you get to the summer, well, maybe there isn't pressure on them ahead of this deadline. But if there's no pressure on them ahead of this deadline, is there then pressure on them this summer to make a move? And then I started to kind of backtrack in my own mind. I'm like, well, I wonder if any of that influences how they approach this deadline as far as a sense of urgency. And I sorry, that was maybe a little convoluted. But like, do you do you see any of those dots connecting as we sit here? What is it? Nine days out? Eight day, not ten days out, whatever it is from February 9th. So I'll give I will say that a lot of trades that happen over the summer happen as results of d- deadline deals that didn't happen. I can I can think the KCP deal, for example, this past summer, where the Wizards Between sent Denver Davis and- Caldwell Pope yep. to Denver for Monte Morris and Will Barton. That deal happens in July. Right. And that trade was this close at the deadline last year. It was this close. It almost got done. It was really close. They didn't put it together. And then come the summer, they were both kind of still on the same page. And they were like, hey, do you want to do that deal? And they worked it out real quick because all of the easy work had been done. So I think whether you're intentionally planning for the upcoming summer or unintentionally planning for the upcoming summer, the work you do leading up to the deadline has an effect on what happens in the upcoming summer. I think it's like, that's not, I don't name that scenario because it's an exceptional one. I name it because it's an extremely common one. That happens all the time where we see trades happen over the summer. And it's like, well, we've been talking about this guy for six months, or we've been talking about this guy since last year, or, oh man, I remember when I recruited this guy, when I was, I was working for a college team and I've known him for 12 years, or I've known his dad forever or whatever. It's like, there's always something like the NBA world is very small in that sense. And so I would, I would say you're kind of always working towards that. That being said, 
if you're talking about a a big move, like I don't know if the huge many time all star is getting traded this off season. The one that we always talk about is the next guy the Knicks could be getting, unless of course you want to talk about like a guy like OG Ananobi, who you know my colleague Shams Sharania reported earlier today that the Knicks have expressed interest in and and have have made offers for. Uh, Fred, do so, we have ESB? Do do we have ESB? Because that was my next question. I think we'd be doing this we too might. much. Oh well, there's no question about that. <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea why we I'm talk, here. We just waste too much time talking to each other. <laughs> yeah, that's actually yes. very true. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, yes, there's OG Ananobi. He's a pretty good player. Yeah, I mean, all right. I have OG takes. I have OG. Uh, takes. Can I? Okay, so I want to. I want to set you up, but and then you could go off in any direction that you want. The OG thing from Shams today is fascinating to me. Uh, I also liked your phrasing that. What did, how did you write it? That he has. There's so much. There's so much smoke following around OG and Obi that there must be flames behind him. Yes, it would seem so. A lot of smoke. Um, two things, and I think they are counter to each other. First thing. Where the Knicks have two first round picks, probably. Unless the Mavs, oh my God, can you imagine if the Mavs finish one of, one of the 10 worst records in the NBA? That would be interesting. I don't think we need to worry about that. I don't think we need to worry about that either. I, They're going to have I two first round pick picks. Probably conveying, yeah. Yes, I think that pick is conveying. And then you have the Knicks pick, which, and we've talked about how teams, you've told me, to, like, I didn't know this until you told me, like every team or most teams, I guess, have models and they do different variations on where they think this pick is going to land or that pick is going to land. And I find that fascinating because here are the Knicks and they're they're a game out of sixth, but as we intimated earlier, they're also I think four games out of sixth in the lottery. Um so like what is the value of their if they were to ever put their unprotected first round pick in this in this year's draft on the table? And then if you fast forward to to late June when the draft takes place, well, we just saw the Knicks have no interest this past draft in adding a young player. Because they're trying to win now. Well, is that changing between now and the draft? So, like, there's the draft stuff. So I'm wondering, well, huh? From that perspective, does it does the mystery of their pick actually make it more valuable to trade now? And I think the only guy potentially on the market, we don't know if Ananobi's on the market for real, that that would be worth putting on the table for might be Ananobi. And then on the flip side of the coin, I'm looking at RJ Barrett. And everyone's going to kill me for this because they all think I hate RJ Barrett. I don't hate RJ Barrett, but there are, I think, reasons that you could come up with why it might make sense for RJ Barrett to be a significant piece to go to Toronto in a potential OG Ananobi trade. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. If you do, feel free to share. That obviously, well, it can happen now. It would involve probably getting the Spurs involved or I suppose the Pacers because of the poison pill and the whole thing makes it harder. And then you'd have to send additional assets to, you know, make it worthwhile for who, all that stuff. I don't, I don't know. Maybe they never trade for an OB. It, but the question I want to ask you is like, do you, do you think there is a, a sense that it, it may be more likely for them to look, do something now as opposed to the summer, or you just think it's a much easier to move to do during the summertime? I think there's a lot of interest in Ananobi right now. I think there are a lot of teams that are hitting up the Raptors pretty hard. I don't know what Toronto is going to do. No one seems to know what Toronto is going to do. So I think if Toronto, I think if Toronto decides to trade OG Ananobi, I think they would get a lot back before the deadline, whether it's the Knicks or somebody else. I think they would get a ton. If they choose to hold on to him, I think it's more kind of up to Toronto. I think if Toronto chooses, I'm kind of thinking out loud. I think it's more up to Toronto because I think if Toronto chooses to trade him, they're going to get a really good offer and the Knicks are going to have to see if they want to top everybody else's offer, which they're capable of, but they're going to have to see if that's what they want to do. And if the Knicks, if Toronto chooses, they don't want to trade him, then Toronto doesn't want to trade him. And then maybe you return to that certain constructs in the summer. And that sort of principle that I was discussing before of like teams discuss certain trades getting up to the deadline and they don't get it done. But then come the summer, Toronto will know, OK, well, we got interest from the Knicks. We got interest from Team X and Team Team Y and Team Z. And let's just call those up. We know that they like them. And let's see if we can work something out more efficiently here. And so that kind of stuff could totally sort of happen over the summer. 
I don't think anybody really knows. Like the whole league is kind of waiting on Toronto because it's not just OG and Anobi. It's it's Gary Trent who can become a free agent this summer. It is Fred Van Vliet who can become a free agent this summer. Uh, and then if it's those three guys, then it's like, it's only natural to wonder about Pascal Siakam, who's got two years left on his deal, including this one. So, you know, I think the whole league is waiting on what the heck is Toronto going to decide to do. And I remember a couple of years ago, the Raptors were awful. It was the pandemic season. They were playing in Tampa. Everything was going terribly. Uh, it was approaching the deadline. They had no hopes of being good. They were pivoting to a tank and everyone and their mother, including Kyle Lowry, had them trading Kyle Lowry. And guess what they didn't do? They didn't trade Kyle Lowry. So they have just, who was in a, an upcoming free agent, by the way, and, and OG's got a couple of years left. So this and when you know, you one just, more, yeah. yeah. So you just don't know. You just, you don't know. Okay, I, I I have a lot of OG takes though, and they're give me, your, give me your takes. I haven't thought them out. Okay, so you, here's well, my let's first start with take. this. Do you do you like or well, no? Give me your take. What's your first take? My first take is if I were going to trade for him, I think the years in the picks would be so important to me. Like if I were going to trade a 2023 first rounder, I would not want to trade a 2025. I would want to trade a 2026, because if you trade a 2025 then you're not going to be able to trade three first rounders this summer because you can only trade picks seven years out. You can't trade them in consecutive years. If you trade a 2026, then this summer, you're able to trade a 24, 28, and a 30. And you're actually able to bring in another star potentially with three unprotected firsts. Also, trading a 26 might allow you to top one protect this year's and move it into the next year just in case you totally crap out and become the luckiest lottery team ever. Like Toronto will probably be down for that. It's so the chances are so minuscule and maybe you give them an extra second rounder or something just to entice them to do it. Uh, so, so that that's my first OB take. Obviously I went to something incredibly or OG take not, that's going to be confusing if it happens. OG, for but OG, I, imagine if you, they were traded for each other. OG for OB. Oh my goodness. That would be rough. Uh, obviously I went to something incredibly niche as opposed to like, Oh, the Knicks, Knicks are interested in a very, very good player. I have a whole thing in the newsletter tomorrow. <laughs> I have a crazy, I have a crazy pick protection idea that I don't even know if it's legal under the CBA. So I, it's not crazy at all. Cause our minds went to the same place. Okay. Well, well now you teased it. What's your idea? I'll talk this out with you. This is, is exceptional podcasting. So I'm wondering can the Knicks include language? Well, actually, I'll, I'll without even getting into specifics. Do you are you aware of anything that is illegal about doing this? Off saying your own pick will convey unless it is within whatever protected range you're going to say it's it's within, and then if the pick doesn't convey, instead of converting to two second rounders, which is or kicking to another year, which is what we often see it converts to other draft assets that the team owns. Are you aware of any illegality in that? You mean like it would convert to the Wizards 2023 pick or and or multiple of the Knicks protected picks? I I don't think you're allowed to do that. But that's a good question. I've never heard that suggested before, but I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to do that. We need Jeremy Cohen on here. I want to find out. I want to find out. I want to, I I haven't gotten a chance to do a deep dive on whether it's possible, but I um, I was kicking it around. In any case, what you can do, this much I know, is if you own another team's pick and it can in the same year as you own your pick, you could then trade your, your own pick in consecutive years, which the Knicks potentially, this could be a situation with them because they own the Dallas pick this year. The complicating factor is the Dallas pick is top 10 protected, so would there be a workaround that would be amenable to both teams as far as the language where, you know, the Knicks would trade their pick reverse protected. So Toronto only gets it if it's a good pick, not if it's a crappy pick. Um, And then the Knicks would take, would get the Dallas pick. But if for some reason the Knicks pick conveyed this year and the Knicks did not end up with the Dallas pick because it landed in the top 10, you would then kick the next draft obligation, I guess, down a year for the Knicks. Because my 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 the whole reason I'm going through all of this is like, can the Knicks trade essentially unprotected picks in 23 and 24? 
and then a swap in 25. And then that would allow them this summer to trade 26, 28, and 30. But again, you couldn't do it cleanly. It would be a little messy. Yeah. It's not, that's, that doesn't sound doable to me. Now, problem. It's not impossible to, to, yeah. Here's the thing. And here's the first thing I thought about when I, because I've been hearing some, some OG rumblings for, for a little while and, and Shams kind of put them out there, was able to get it. Um, But here's the thing that I've been wondering. I think it's going to take a lot for him. Whoever gets him, if they trade him, is not doing it with less than two unprotected first round picks. I agree. It might be more. It's just not happening. You know what trade that people don't talk about enough? People talk about how the go bear trade ruined the market. Some people, like the real nerds, talk about how the DeJounte Murray trade ruined the market. You know what? You know what the the biggest the biggest losers talk about as the trade that ruined the market, which set all of this off that was before the DeJounte Murray trade that caused the DeJounte Murray trade. Now you're really, now I feel like an idiot because I can't think of what. No, you're not an idiot because it is, it is a random ass deal. It is the Derek white trade. Oh my God. Where it was because, that a top, top one protected swap in 28 or something. It's a it swap. Unprotected? It's a swap and it's a, swap. a straight swap. And swaps never go for role players. And when that happened and they got a first rounder from the Celtics and a swap for a guy who was a a really good role player, but unquestionably a role player, that's what changed everything. Because now all of a sudden the Spurs are like, Hey Hawks, we got a first and a swap for Derek white. You kidding me? This is DeJounte Murray for giving up our role player guard. Then Lord knows our all-star guard is going to get more than that. So it's going to take two picks and they're going to have to be unprotected and we're going to want the swap. And how about that? How about that Charlotte pick also while we're at it? And then the market just spirals in craters that that Derek White trade, which which actually was a very mutually beneficial trade. I think both teams would do that 100 times out of 100. Help the Celtics get to the finals. And Derek White is having an incredible year again this year. Might help him win a title. Uh, and and by the way, is on a, a solid contract locked up for a long time and the Spurs are rebuilding and they got a bunch of picks out of it. So they're probably thrilled too. But that trade changed so much. And that's how you get to a place where OG Ananobi might cost you two or three picks. And you know, the thing that I've been thinking about the whole time, which is like, this is a front office. I'm not going to say it's solely operated based on perception because that's not true. But there have been moments where we've seen that they care about perception. One of those ways that we've seen that is with Cam Reddish, where they've they traded a protected first for Cam Reddish. It might not convey whatever. I'm just telling you what they've told other teams, which is we traded a first for Cam Reddish, so we value him like a first. They have said that to teams. Uh, it hasn't worked. That's why Cam Reddish is still in the Knicks. Uh, other teams don't value him as a first. But... They have said that. And I think part of the hesitation in a Reddish trade is the optics of, well, you can't trade a first for a guy, even if it's a heavily protected first that may never convey. You can't trade a first for a guy and then trade and then never play him, kill his value, and then trade him for way less a year later. So I think that's been part of the hesitation. And that's about optics and perception. It's not about strategy. If it were just strategy, they didn't care at all about optics and perception, then they'd say, okay, well, sunk costs. Let's get something out of this before he leaves in free agency this summer because we don't want to offer him the qualifying offer. So that makes me think it's more likely that we're going to see him not cam for salary filler and some second, but that he will be used in a trade where it will be less easy to dis- not decipher. But yeah, like, him him and Fournier for a big salary. You could fight him it. and Fournier to yeah. Toronto for a guy who I don't know, I can't think of. So so anyway, my my grander point is not about Cam. I'm using Cam as an example. Here's what I'm getting at. If the Knicks trade three unprotected first rounders for OG Ananobi right after they didn't do it for Donovan Mitchell, I can't imagine what the reaction to that will be because 
people are going to put that together. And I, I cannot imagine that that thought is not going to cross their minds about like, how could we refuse to trade three protected, unprotected firsts for Donovan Mitchell? And I recognize there was a lot more than just three unprotected firsts and what Utah wanted. Obviously, there's RJ and Grimes or whatever the young guys are, clearly. But if we're just talking about perception, not reality, perception is what people think of you, not what you're doing. And if you're worried about the perception, which they've shown at times that it doesn't control what they do, it doesn't dictate all of their decisions, but it it does cross their minds. I have to imagine that is going to cross their mind at some point if it hasn't already. Um, you talk about perception mattering to this front office. Was it three minutes before the Mitchell trade was announced that they made the Barrett extension official? That's Got true. that one just under the gun. Complete coincidence. That that got stuck out. Oh, uh, man. Yeah. Uh, I <clears throat> I can't fathom then trading three unprotected picks for Ananobi. Can you? Before the deadline? No. No, I can't. I, I also like... Here's my other OG take, which is probably going to get me killed. Oh, boy. I think he's a very good player. But he is a a role player Hmm? and it's the market's just blown up too much. Like it's blown up too much. I, I I can't think of a, of a team like if, okay, if the Knicks trade for OG and an OB, if they give up no players in their rotation, what are they going to do? Jump from sixth place to sixth place. Like I, I just don't see it being that. And he's a good player. And, and if you know, you want to make a star trade, you could, you could, you know, use him in the star trade because he's a very good player, but it's, it's just tough. I also don't love the Knicks fit as much as everybody else seems to. I don't think they would use, I, people seem excited about it. I don't know. Maybe I'm misreading the situation. So that's why that's again, why I brought up RJ. Like I could, I could pretty quickly talk myself into Bronson Grimes or quickly, I guess, pick one. Um, Ananobi and Randall and and Mitch as a a team that makes a lot of sense. Um, not a title winning team, not a team that's higher than sixth uh, place in the East, but a team that makes a lot of sense. And then I could really talk myself into a team where if you swapped out the Randall piece for a real number one star with the right role players. I can really talk myself into that team doing some damage. Um, I don't see Ananobi making a ton of sense, like basically in the Grimes spot in the starting lineup. Like I, I don't know. I don't I think there's a possibility the team might play worse um, with that particular construction. Cause like I, it, it feels clunky. You're losing your best point of attack defender. Cause like OG Ananobi is, is a bigger guy. He's not, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. By by the way, I hesitated to answer that because uh, I texted a cap guy who works for a team and asked him your question, and I was incorrect. You can do what you just suggested. You, no, you're allowed to do it, but it has to be whatever portion the team owns. But they they couldn't do it for like the Washington pick because it's the same year and could conceivably convey. So it would have to be for like the Milwaukee pick. In 2025. Uh, okay. I understand. That makes sense. Cause yeah. Okay. Cause you can't do it with a yeah. pick that could convey in the same year and have like, okay. That right. makes sense. Exactly. Cause then it wouldn't work. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I also think I would be concerned about the spacing. You're taking out your best shooter out of the starting lineup and you're putting in Ananobi, who's like a 36% three point shooter and he's good in the corners and all that. But Teams really help off of him, and the Knicks ball movement is not as good as the Raptors. And and by the way, like the Raptors put him in the corner, but the Raptors are not some sort of all world half court offense because of it. Like teams freely help off of him. Like he's shooting thirty six percent, that's solid, but it's thirty six percent on a lot of open 
looks because teams would rather just like slice in on Siakam in the lane than and 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 they'll live they'll live with him taking those shots. Uh and and the other side of it is I think he's a he's a pretty excellent, he's a phenomenal defender, actually. He's a really phenomenal defender. And he is he is a much better defender than Grimes. So I don't I don't worry. That doesn't concern me. But the reason that you would want OG Ananobi is because he's so versatile. Like if you have him, you take that versatility and you run with it. And that's part of the reason he's really good on the Raptors because the Raptors are the team of like, okay, our five best players are just all our four best players are just six foot nine wings. And then it's Fred Van Vliet. Well, that's who we're starting. Screw the centers. Like that's what we're going to do. And I, I don't think the Knicks would run with his versatility. I just don't think the fit is great. I think what they would do is they would probably use him to, honestly, they would probably use him similarly to how they use quickly defensively, where they'd they'd have him guard shooters in the weak side corner, and he'd have to he'd have to dig into the lane, and he'd have to close out on shooters, and he'd probably be fantastic about it at it, similarly to how quickly is, and I'm sure he'd be better because he's he's bigger and he's stronger and he's longer and he is a phen- he's not a very good defender. He's a phenomenal all defense caliber defender who is legitimately good at everything. But like if you have OG Ananobi, you want to be probably switching like crazy and letting him show off how we can guard a million positions and the Knicks don't defend that way. And and also like Guarding a million positions means playing in a million different roles. And I don't think that they would necessarily play like Randall at the five, OG at the four. Uh, I don't think that those lineups are going to happen much. So so Grimes' minutes are probably going to be cut, but not for OG, for like Isaiah Hartenstein or Jericho Sims. And I think that that could be an issue too. I feel like I'm like ripping into the Knicks for a trade they didn't make no but this is illuminating because he's a name and like he has a very interesting skill set but one as you said he is a role player he is not a guy that is going to fundamentally but he's an excellent role player like he plays his role great he has a he has a great argument as as literally the best role player in the east that's actually not crazy yeah i mean and it's not it's not that he's a bad fit to be clear if the Knicks got him, they would be somewhere between better and much better. Like it's not like he's a he's a bad fit. He it's that I don't know if the fit is good enough to justify the price. And that's really the way that I sh- I should probably think about things that I say before I come on a podcast. I I don't know if the fit is good enough to justify the price, you know? Cuz the price is going to be extremely high. It's going to be extremely high. It's going to be a lot of picks. You're going to need those if a trade happens. And unless, of course, I'm wrong. And if they could just get them for a first, then then sure, of course, that's wonderful. But I don't think that's going to be the case. I think, um, you know, it's funny because we said the same thing about the Mitchell trade. It makes sense for a team that is closer to contention, that has more key pieces in place already to trade for Donovan Mitchell. You could really make the same argument about it. OG Ananobi, you know, Um, because if you're if you're trading for him as like a big as a big piece, a big component to what you're doing, you're probably as you very explained very well, you're probably gonna be disappointed, Um, at least with the ultimate results, maybe not in him in particular. And yeah, I mean, the Knicks, again, they're not one piece away, but it creates this dynamic, this conundrum, whatever you want to say. And we'll we could maybe close on this before I, I. we, I talk about the quickly thing real quick. Um, you wrote about a bunch of guys. You wrote about a bunch of teams today. Give me one or two, if you want, whatever, that you think would make sense, given what the Knicks are looking to probably looking to pay, um, what their priorities are, all the things you wrote about last week and like the, the, the questions to ask. Like, who, who do you have your eye on? What teams do you have your eye on? Okay, I'm going to give you two. And these are not necessarily based on my reporting, by the way, these are just like if I were running the Knicks, these are these are two guys I'd be looking out for. I think Eric Gordon makes a lot of sense for them. I've always preached in the choir. 
And, and, and for what it's worth, I am not convinced that Eric Gordon's defense got bad. I'm just not. I just think this is the ultimate change of scenery situation. It's like that guy is the most openly checked out player. <laughs> I, I've, you wrote I've that for years. You wrote <laughs> for years, for years. It's I'm normally not a big, like unprovable take guy in my writing. I'll throw some, some shit out on a podcast, but I'm not a big unprovable take guy in my writing at all. But I was like, I think this is actually quite provable. I think he's, He's like he's like in post game interviews being like, so, Eric, what improvement do you see? And he just looks at the interviewer with just an expressionless face and says, there is no improvement. Like he's a character from Office Space or something like it's 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 unbelievable. (laughs) He's so openly miserable and wants out so bad. So I'm like, how am I supposed to grade this guy's defense, which is for his whole career, by the way, been totally acceptable. Uh, how am I supposed to grade his defense and when he's playing with a bunch of kids? They play the worst team defense in the league, that team. And it's it's a bunch of guys in their young 20s who, who, who don't know the league and don't know how to play. And how am I supposed to grade that? And, and, and the Rockets are saying that they want a first for Eric Gordon. And I'm like, okay, I'm just not buying that. I'm just not... Fine, that's going to happen. I've heard scenarios where the Rockets have told teams, "Oh yeah, we want a first for this guy," and and then they just end up letting the guy go because they overplayed their hand negotiating. So, like, you know, maybe that's what happens. But I, I just I don't think that I don't think that's what's going to happen here. I, I imagine something will go, and and I think Rose and Fournier or Rose and uh, Reddish would make a lot of sense because then the Rockets could at least sell, hey, got a young player, can take a look. I think Reddish is is totally the Rockets type. They like those guys who are like athletic, long, high high school ranked, you know, have potential. See if you can tap into, you know, that guy, if you can teach him how to play, you know, if you can, if you can just teach KPJ how to play, if you can just teach Christian Wood how to play, you know, they, they want those guys and and they believe that they can, they can develop those guys. So I, I think that trade just makes sense. And, and Gordon can shoot, he can create, he's a deep three point shooter, by the way, he's not just a three point shooter. So he'll space out to like. 27 and and defenses will guard him out to 27 30 feet and you know what else he still does a lot he still drives a lot i was looking it up the other day he still drives like eight times a game um which is for a guy that plays whatever he plays 26 27 28 minutes a night that's you know he's, he's a- just he's just hoping somebody will foul him really hard knock him out and he'll forget about the last two years <laughs> yeah that's, no, that's the only that- reason that's a great I he's always he's been at the top of my list for a while for a lot of the reasons you articulated. Who who's the other guy? I'm curious. The other one is a much smaller deal that absolutely nobody's talking about, but I wrote about him in that story. And after I wrote the story, I started to think about it more and I was like, I'm into this. And it's Gary Harris. Oh, yeah. I you know, I saw that and I'm like, huh. Makes a lot of money. He, and they signed him to an extent. They just signed him to an extension, didn't they? Yeah, they re-signed him last year. And and part of the reason why I like Gary Harris is because of his contract. So it's it's not just the number that he makes. So he makes about thirteen million this year, and thirteen million next year. Uh, but so so Harris is he's not you know the guy that he was in Denver. But I have to imagine, I I cannot imagine the price for getting him would be all that much. I just. I, I don't see it. Uh, I think you could probably throw a couple seconds at him. Like that's like, you know, like, 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 like you can get an expiring, like when Memphis got an expiring Courtney Lee for two second rounders, you know, that's, that's that trade. That's that trade. I, I think you could probably get him for two second rounders. And if you can do that, like 40% three point shooter over the last two years, good team player, really low maintenance. You just kind of plug him in. He's going to guard hard. Like I like that. And on top of that, what Gary Harris has, which is really valuable for them, is he makes $13 million next year, but his salary isn't guaranteed. And by the way, Eric Gordon is in a similar situation too. So that if a, and his guarantee date is after the draft, which means that if a star trade 
pops up on draft night, they can guarantee Gary Harris's contract and they can send him out. And if it doesn't pop out, then they don't have to guarantee him. And Eric Gordon's a similar thing where he makes about 21 million next year and that's non-guaranteed. And his guarantee date is late as well. Uh, and that's something where I think the Knicks appreciate that kind of flexibility. You know, Derek Rose is in a similar situation, but but the difference with Rose and Gary Harris is Rose is a team option. You can't move the deadline on the team option that's written into the collective bargaining agreement. So if if the Knicks don't have a trade on if the Knicks don't have a trade on draft night, then they have to decide on the Derrick Rose team option. And obviously they're going to decline that because they're not picking up 15 million for a guy who's not in their rotation. But if they don't have a trade on draft night, but they have a guess or they have a good feeling for whatever the reason that a star trade is going to pop up a week later, come the start of free agency, what they can do is they can go to Gary Harris's reps and they can say, Hey, do you guys want to move the, his, his guarantee date is, is the end of July. I forget when they can, or end of June. I'm sorry. They can go to Gary Harris's reps and they can say, Hey, do you want to move your guarantee date back to like July 4th or July 6th or something like that? And when you actually do that, we're probably just going to trade you in order to trade you. Then we're going to have to guarantee the contract and Gary's going to get the $13 million that he's going to make as opposed to hitting the open market and getting probably less than $13 million in free agency. So if they tell, if they think there's a really good chance of that happening, and by the way, teams uh, are totally not tampering and doing all this stuff before. (laughs) If the Knicks had a pretty good idea, they were signing Jalen Brunson leading into the draft and thus started dumping all of that salary. They're going to have a pretty good idea on if there is going to be a star they're going to be able to get on July 6th or something like that. So Gary Harris' agent is probably going to agree to be able to push back that guarantee date. And so that gives them a lot of flexibility. And that's a good middling salary. If you combine, then all of a sudden, by the way, if you have a good idea of it, like you've got Fournier's salary that's that's you know 19 million next year. You've got Rose's if you want to pick up the team option, which is I think 15.6. You've got Gary Harris's then, which is flexible, or you have Gordon's if you choose to do it with him and he's got a similar non-guarantee thing. And then you're up to like 40 something million in expiring salary. And you could just make a whole trade, just like take all the picks and you can keep all your players and, and you can get there in salary that with, with basically no meaningful players. And, and, and so I think that is also a reason why I really like Harris. He can help you now. You have to give up basically nothing to get him, I assume. Uh, respected vet and good shooter. And the contract makes so much sense for what their plans could be this summer. That's a great call, Fred. That was it's what I'm here for. That was like watching Michelangelo paint uh, <laughs> something good. No, that was really good. The, the, the move, the guarantee date. That was good. That was good. Hey, I'm trying to speak things into existence. And, and you think. and you can f- kind of confirm my theory by by texting someone who would know. So that's even even better. Um, let's end with a bang. You um, later this week on Wednesday. So I guess tomorrow, as people are listening to this, can we, dropping- can we just say that that Andrew Andrew has good job, Fred. Yes. Flashing, flashing across the screen. Because right Andrew's now. the best. You're, you're the best. Andrew's the best. <laughs> this is why you guys are better off without me when you guys pod together. Um, I'll take the next, the next one off as well. Um, you have a piece dropping about Emmanuel quickly, and you've let is uh, let us in. See, I sound like you when you were asking the question to Kevin Durant. Um, you've let us in on what the piece is about a little bit. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want you to divulge anything that you don't want to divulge. But g- give me a little greeny tease for the piece that you have dropping on IQ. Yeah. So the reason I actually wrote about this story was because of a conversation that we had about quickly the last time we were on the podcast. And I was like, oh, that'd be an interesting story. We were talking about how quickly we'll run this type of defense. They'll use the the next. will use this little wrinkle with quickly where. He'll actually help from the strong side, even though conventionally you're not supposed to do that on drivers. And uh, he executes these really clever switches while doing it. And I wanted to delve into how this dude, who's still young and 23 years old, went from as a rookie being like, man, he what a great scorer. But if he's not hitting buckets, then he's not giving you anything to 
man, if only he could score, he would do everything. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to, to delve into that. And he is, he's really, really obsessed with the my the the basketball minutia and I'm specifically talking about or I'm specifically writing about and delving into and I've done all the reporting and all of that for it and it's going to come out later this week but I uh he's specifically uh, the story will specifically focus on his evolution as a communicator on defense and and just how vocal he is you know you can watch you can watch games and uh you can you can see He's the guy in transition pointing at everybody. Okay, you take him, you take him. I got ball, you got ball, whatever. Uh, you can you can see him orchestrating that. You can see him in the half court. Like watch him at the top of the key. Something he does is pretty amazing. He'll be defending at the top of the defense. And he will be calling out what the other team's plays are, just the top. And that's so rare. That's normally the job of the big man because the big man is like the catcher, right? Like he's got the advantage where he can see the whole court because he's the last line of defense quickly can't see that. So I've spoken about that with quick and he's talked about how he can, he knows other teams actions and other teams plays so well that he recognizes, okay, these are what the guys at the top are doing. So I know what everybody else on the court is supposed to do. And he's able to call all of that out. And, and he's just a very obsessive film studier like that. Uh, I have a fantastic quote from Mitchell Robinson about, yes, but let's not blow the quote, but I will say it is a, it is, it is, it is such a good quote about Emmanuel quickly stealing his job as he puts it. Uh, it is, it is a great quote. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's great. I mean, quick, quick was like super into it. He's, he's a big basketball nerd and he, um, he was nice enough to watch a couple of plays with me and break some stuff down for me. Yeah. And, uh, and even like, I, I had like, I even had my, after that Cleveland game the other night, when uh, last week they play Cleveland, they win that game against Cleveland. The one where Hartenstein had the game winning block. That was a foul, but wasn't a foul. And quickly does his post game media and after he does his media scrum he turns to me and his face lights up lights up and he says do you see my play and i was like i don't i don't know what you're talking about what play he was like that great play that i made and i was like i don't know the th-. he never talks like that i was like i don't know the 3 like the 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 and one like i don't know what what you're <laughs> referring to and and he goes no man in the fourth quarter, I had an incredible pre-rotation onto a Coro in the corner. And I was like, dude, <laughs> you must think I am such a nerd because, <laughs> because I was, I was like, I was like, I'm so proud as a beat reporter that this dude is like, do you see my incredible play? And it was just a pre-rotation onto a corner three point shooter. Uh, and, and to be clear, by the way, a pre-rotation is anticipating where the ball is going to be and rotating out to that guy. And it did end in a seal for the Knicks. So he was, but he was so excited. He didn't care about the steal. He was so excited about nailing the pre-rotation. It was like, I made a great pre-rotation and he was so excited about the pre-rotation, but I just, it was very funny. And, and, and he knew that I thought I w- it was going to make me laugh, but I also thought it was just like a great moment of like th- this guy who people, I feel like his rep is only cares about scoring. And, and maybe that's what he used to be like. I don't know. I, I, I didn't know him his rookie year, but, but he uh, really has become very obsessed with all of the little things and really proud of all the little things that, that he's able to, you know, to do. Three things. One, as if every Nick fan didn't, universally adore this player and um, would would uh, storm the garden with, uh, you know, torches and, and pitchforks if he was ever traded. Um, they they will more so now after after hearing that story. One, two, I had this in the newsletter earlier today. Um, this is over the last 20 games. His on off numbers have been great all year, but over the last 20 games, when he is not on the court, the Knicks are giving up. <laughs> 127 point um, zero points per 100 possessions. That's not a good number. When he's on the court, it's 111.1. 
difference of about 16 points per hundred. It's actually not that difference from his year long. Year long number like four. Yeah. So it, it's just it's it just keeps getting better. Um, I guess is the point. And um do I do I have a number three? I had a number three. I know I forgot it. I think it was I think I was gonna um give you shit for writing for re- writing for reporting that the team was listening to trade calls um on him earlier this year or making trade calls on him earlier this year. Basically I was gonna get mad at you for doing your job again. Um which don't kill the messenger, is. man. I wasn't making the calls. I know you weren't. I know you weren't. Well, you were making calls to f- find out about the calls, which is again that's that's job, true. So like, but don't don't kill the messenger. My my job is just to be the messenger that gets killed. Like, do you know how often I'm a messenger that gets killed? Just all the time. I'm like, I'm just putting it out there, guys. I didn't make the calls. I don't know. I'll tweet out the starting lineup, and they'll be like, Oh my god, why is that the starting lineup? I'm like, I don't know. I just <laughs> I'm just telling you what it is. That's all. That's all it is. I just. And and you have since reported, among other people, that they have perhaps changed their stance on how much they do or don't want to trade him. I knew quickly. I hope. I, I don't. There's a lot of things I won't really care all that much about if they do or don't do this trade deadline. I. I will be. I will rest easier when the trade deadline passes, and hopefully he's still on the roster. I'll just say that. Oh, I know you will. <laughs> he's he's really become a good player. He's really become a a good player. And and by the way, you mentioned over those last twenty games the the defensive on offs, and those were always really really good, dating back a long time. But his efficiency has been really good in January. He I I, I think the true shooting is over sixty percent this month, which is like a great number. Uh, the, on the season, I think the true shooting is up to fifty five, fifty six for the season. I I think it is. Barely, barely, barely a career high right now. 55, 56, that range, which is, which is, it's, un, you know, like three years ago, that would have been above league average. And now it's like well below league average because offense has just spiked to such an insane degree. Like league average effective field goal percentage is 54 right now. It's wild. Like I used to think, okay, if you're over, I'm still thinking like if you're over 50, you're good. You know, if you're over 50, that is, that's not like acceptable. Like that's good. And, and, and now you see 54 is league average. It's like, oh my goodness. It's just hard to adjust your mind to it. But, but for quickly, it's like the, the efficiency is getting a lot better. He's hitting shots and he's, he's kind of taking the right ones. And, you know, if he, if he can get to the line as much as he was before, which I don't know how much of his not getting to line as much this year has to do with his efficiency actually going up. But, um, you know, I, I don't really know the answer. I would have to delve into that more. But, you know, if, if he could maintain this with with a better free throw rate, like Honey had that he had during his his rookie season, then, you know, all of a sudden you got you got something really going. Yeah, it's uh, you, you, you hit that on the head in January. It's the consistency. And I, that's the other stat that I saw is 50 percent effective field goal percentage in 11 of his last 12 games for a guy who I feel like throughout this season and throughout his career has had a lot of nights where you look up and he's like, oh, quickly was two for nine and one for six from deep. It's like if he could just cut those out, which he has been now. Um, yeah, I don't really know what what more you would want from this play. I, I think Grimes was my favorite. Grimes or Brunson was my favorite thing about the early part of the season. Uh, I think it might be quickly now. He's. I get that. There's, I mean, you know, what's interesting with him with the efficiency is I think he's, again, I would have to go back and look at this to make sure I'm totally right. But, but I, I think he's really cut out a lot of the bad shots. And that's something I've been thinking about more. There were so many really, really bad shots. I just don't think he really takes them nearly as much. I think he's sort of figured out this is a good shot. This is fine. And these are the moments where it's okay to take a bad shot. You know, there was a game a few games ago where he took five shots. He shot the ball really well and he only took five shots. And after that game, I was thinking, I was like, if this game were a year ago, instead of finishing five for five, he would have finished like seven for 16. He would have started five for five and finish like seven for 12. And we would have been like, this was a good game, but he would have added a two for seven on the end of the five for five, which wouldn't have been a good stretch. And now he's like, I am just going to, it's not like he's shooting and stopping. It's just like, I'm a man. You know what? I hate, I hate myself for this. I'm going to use a Tibbs phrase. 
Do it. I'm just going to do what the defense tells me to do. It's true. But you know what? It's good advice. It's great advice. All of this good advice. All the sketch phrases are great. You could live a good life, Fred Katz, by just following Tom Thibodeau's advice. Translated. You know what? I I loved his answers. I know you don't want to talk about Dolan, but I, I loved his answers to the Dolan questions about the playoffs. I thought they were oh, extremely yeah. illuminating about who he is as a person. I, Nobody, I, nor, I normally he's very droll and doesn't want to, you know, expose anything, but I thought in not wanting to expose anything, he really showed his character. Uh, you, you know, he was asked numerous times about Dolan saying that the goal is the playoffs. And he was asked if that puts pressure on him to make the playoffs. And he just said, I don't feel pressure. I never feel pressure. If you do everything that you can each and every day, then you're never going to feel pressure. I was like, damn. You know, that was like that was like the most zen that I've heard Tibbs. Like, like he's you know, it's he's so intense and he's so not zen at all. Like, which is why I think him and Derek Rose are such an interesting duo because Rose is very like the like you know very chill in that sense. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, I I thought that was a really illuminating response from him. Now, you know, it might have been total BS, but no, but you know, I it's it not was interesting. You know, you know, it's not total BS because, you know, this is a man who approaches every minute of every day with how can I make the best use of this next minute? To advance yeah, that's all. Michael. That's all he cares about. How can I make the best use of this next minute? And the answer is leave your rim protector out there. That's it. We have to that that we're we're ending on that. Fred Katz, for anybody who somehow still does not know where to find you, can you let the folks at home know uh, where they can do so? Yes, uh, you can read my stuff over at the Athletic. Got that quickly piece that we talked about coming out uh, later this week. I'm going to have something eval a piece that I do every year that a lot of our writers do, and it's always just like I don't know. I love I love doing these pieces. I always have a lot of fun writing them. Uh, I just put out the call uh, for it. Uh, fans are sending in Nick's trade ideas and I'm evaluating the trades. I love writing those pieces. I always have. I just think that's like, it's like the most fun. You know, it's like a mailbag type, but it's so fun. I'm going to have that for later this week. So you can check that out. And I always think those are fun to read when other writers do them. And, and, and I love writing them. They're really fun. It's really fun sifting through the questions and being like, yeah, like I have to put in the thing. Like, it has to work under the salary cap for me to put this in. And if it's a little bit off, it's only, you know, it's a dollar off. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I, we can totally talk about this, but it's just like, we're not going to trade a minimum player for LeBron. So every once in a while, every once in a while you get those, but I, I actually like NBA fans are smart, man. Like they know their stuff. I feel like that's why I don't dumb down my content. I, I feel like people know, like feel like people want smart content. So you see the trades and you're like, Damn, this is just like a random fan. That's a pretty good trade. And I, I always enjoy those pieces. I can't wait to read it. I did not know that that was coming. I'm very excited about it. Um, I have a rule that because people, you know, my DMs are open. People DM me fig trades all the time. I have a rule that if I open the 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 picture that is sent and it's so it's so thin because the list of players and teams is like, it's like a 27 player trade between I'm like, I just, I, I think I responded to someone who said, I'm like, this would literally be the largest trade in NBA history. And that's all I said. I just, I didn't have another response. <laughs> I cover, I cover the largest trade in NBA history and how I felt professionally was how you feel opening those up. It was the one that beat the Dwight trade, right? Or did uh, uh, getting yes, up. yeah. Okay. It was it was a five five team deal. It was the one where Russell Westbrook went from the Wizards to the Lakers. Oh, this and the, the, Wizards, the, the Dinwiddie. Yeah, that's right. The Dinwiddie trade. Yeah, it was Dinwiddie. The Wizards got Dinwiddie, and they got Kuzma, and they spliced the Pacers into that one. They sent Chandler Hutchison to the Spurs, and and the Spurs sent a draft rights guy to Brooklyn, and Brooklyn got a trade exception, and there were draft picks flying everywhere. And and I think my lead to the story was like a Stefan impression, being like, "This trade has everything. It's got draft rights, and and 
I think that was like my lead to the whole thing. And it was, it was just, oh, I, that was so exhausting trying to follow everything that went with that. But that was really, I, I'm so glad I got to report on that trade because I love weird and HMBA stuff and being able to report on some of that and being able to report some of the details of it. I, I was, that was so exciting. That was so fun. And a notable trade, probably. I mean, who knows how it ends in La La Land? But like, who? I mean, if if this if things somehow go poorly for the Lakers moving forward, what, people might look back on that trade and say maybe that was not the best use of assets for the. No question. Don't you think that Kuzma and KCP would be perfect for the Lakers right now? Because not exactly what they need. And they had the salary to get healed. They had the heel trade was done. The heel trade was agreed to, and then they pivoted. So yeah, they didn't even need to do that one though. Like Kuzma, I think good. it would have helped them. What? Who, I forget who would who would have been the salary to go out for. It would have been Kuzma, Kuzma, and Montrez Harrell for healed. Didn't they have another salary they could have sent out for healed? I mean, I might be imagining. That. No, it was Kuzma, and Montrez Harrell, but then in the Westbrook trade, it also had KCP. That's okay. Yep. <clears throat> with with the heel trade, they would have kept KCP. That's an interesting slide. Which which of those two scenarios stay as is or make the heel trade? Well, we know which was the worst scenario, which is the one that they made. But it's enough enough Lakers talk. Um, even though they're playing each other tomorrow, Fred Katz, you're amazing. I don't have anything else to say. You're amazing. Thank you. You're the best.